and welcome to our midweek meeting. This is the third time that we've met in this way to seek the face of God. I trust that the Lord will be with you and bless you. You're in your own home and I trust that you would know God's presence as we join together to hear his word and to seek his face in prayer. Would we bow with a word of prayer? Eternal and ever-loving God, we thank you that we come into your presence in the name of our risen Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we come into your very throne room and we pray that this evening we might know sweet delight in your presence as we seek your face. Pray that you would lift up our hearts, Lord. We pray that we would be encouraged in our spirits. We pray that your word would be refreshing to our souls. We pray, Heavenly Father, that though we are parted by distance, that we would know that we are one in spirit, one in the Lord. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it is precious. And Father, we pray that we would know something of the honey of the word of God to this evening. That it would be sweet in our mouths. We pray, Heavenly Father, that truly that we might taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, Father in heaven, we pray for any who are feeling downcast, any who are low in spirit, that you might lift them up. We realise, Lord, that sometimes, Lord, we rise as on eagles' wings. And sometimes, Lord, we find ourselves, Lord, by your grace and by your mercy, skipping like the deer in the mountains. But at other times, Lord, we feel down in the dumps and we're struggling. And so, Father, we pray for any who might be feeble-minded and low in spirit, Father, that you would encourage them this evening. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would touch each one of us and give us real prayer this evening. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, for his glory. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I wonder how you're feeling at this time. Some of you may be encouraged. It's been a change of routine. Two weeks now since the lockdown, you've been able to get a number of things done that you haven't done for quite a while. You've maybe spent time reading, maybe you've spent more time in prayer, more time maybe with immediate family that live with you. You've enjoyed the sunshine as well and maybe your garden. And for some of you, you're quite encouraged in your spirit because you're looking at what God is doing in your life and in your family and maybe in the life of others and you're encouraged. Others of you maybe are discouraged, frustrated, maybe very worried, fearful for relatives, fearful for older people, fearful for the nations, concerned as to the future. Maybe some of you are frustrated, frustrated that you're not able to get out and do the normal things in life. You're finding this change in routine very difficult. But well, I think for all of us, there's probably a bit of a mixture of both of that. At times we feel, when is this going to end? And at times we are really concerned for certain people. And other times we're just so grateful for the kindness and the love of God, for so many things, for our NHS, for those who are supporting them, for the shops, the ways in which, for example, Tesco's are taking wonderful measures to help the NHS workers and, uh, and vulnerable people. And now supplying a million meals to um, NHS staff and so much to give thanks to God for at this time, God's common grace. So we have a mixture of emotions, thankfulness, and yet at the same time, we struggle over various things. And sometimes it's in the night, in those long hours of the night when we wake up, certain burdens can be placed heavily upon our hearts. Well, this evening, I'd like you to turn with me to Psalm 91. I trust that this psalm will be refreshing to you, that this psalm might be a comfort to your soul, that the Lord will bless it to you. If we have time, we'll also look at another couple of portions of scripture as well. So open your Bible with me to Psalm 91. Shall we hear the word of God? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. 
His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Well, brothers and sisters, Times have changed, but our God has not changed. The Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Yesterday, today, forever. Jesus is the same. Our God continues to be a refuge, continues to be a stronghold. All may change around us. But our God is a rock to us, one on whom we can depend. And the psalmist discovered this to be true. We pen this psalm for our encouragement. No matter how bad the days may be, no no matter how many attacks we may feel upon our minds and our hearts, we can have confidence in the God who delivers his people. Now, we're not told who was the author of Psalm 91. Some believe it's Moses. Moses wrote the previous Psalm, Psalm 90. And that would seem to fit for various reasons. Moses lived at a time where God's people suffered plague. Do you remember how the Lord plagued them in those 40 years in the wilderness? But God was gracious to them. God was with them. Though some were slain, the larger part were freed. Moses also was sent into Egypt and plagues came upon the Egypt, Egyptians and God brought his people out of Egypt, away from that place of plague. We read in Exodus 19 verse 4, God brought his people out of the places of the plagues on eagles' wings, swiftly. And then in Deuteronomy 8 verse 15, we learn that he led them through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions. Yes, there were times of rebellion. Yes, there were times of the chastening of the Lord. God was with his people at that time, bringing them through, protecting the nation. Now, Psalm 91 refers particularly to the Israelites. They were in a covenant relationship with Jehovah. Jehovah had made promises to them, promises of blessing, promises of protection, promises of material prosperity, if they as a nation kept his law. But Jehovah had also pronounced curses for them, curses of war and of pestilence and of famine if they should break their side of the covenant bargain, if they should disobey the statutes and judgments and laws of God. So Psalm 91 is written to a people who are in covenant relationship with God in a special covenant. And if they are stayed in that dwelling place, if they were those who are abided in him under the shadow of his wings, keeping close to him, 
The Lord had promised to them as a nation that he would deliver them from a perilous pestilence. That didn't mean that some wouldn't suffer sickness and some wouldn't die, but as a nation, God will preserve his people. Now, verses 1 and 2 are very personal words of assurance. Notice the psalmist uses the first person. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. This was his certainty. This was his assurance that as he was there under the shadow of the Almighty, trusting in him, that he would know that God was his refuge and his fortress. That was his personal assurance. But then verses 3 to 13 are not in the first person, but in the second person, the second person. Words addressed to you. He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. He shifted from the first person to his personal experience, his personal assurance of the protection and the love of God for all those who come near to him. And now he's addressing you. He's addressing his fellow Israelites. He's addressing those who are in covenant with the Lord. You know, as all of the scriptures point to the Lord Jesus Christ, and not only the ones that we count as messianic psalms, but all of the scriptures in one form or other point us to Jesus Christ. I believe the words that we have before us speak in particular of the Son of God, the Israel of God. You see, Satan understood that and he sought to use the words against the Lord Jesus. He will quote from this psalm, when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted, Satan, knowing that this psalm was from the Lord Jesus, took it, took it up, it was for the Lord Jesus, and so he used it against him. Verses 12 and 13, he tempts Jesus to throw himself off of the pinnacle of the temple, saying, in their hands these angels shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Sorry, verses 11 and 12. The angels will take charge over you. If you throw yourself off, they will catch you. They will keep you from dashing your feet against the rocks. He knew that this psalm was for the Lord Jesus. But he was tempting Jesus to use these very words that were for him in a way which would dishonour his God. So let's consider these words not only as words for us, but words about the Lord Jesus. You see, the Lord Jesus was kept throughout his life. There were many attempts upon his life. There were many terrors that came to him by night. He was in very dangerous and difficult situations. He was fully man. And he was surrounded often by sick people. He would touch a leper. That most contagious of diseases. And didn't contract leprosy. He was in the place of fever. He was in the house of Simon Peter's mother-in-law who had a very high fever. He healed her. He raised her up. When there were multitudes of sick people with all sorts of diseases around him. Not once did he contract anything. The Lord kept him from the perilous pestilence. There were times when people picked up stones and sought to throw them at him, but God protected him. Surely the angels did intervene. Do you remember that time when the 
people from Nazareth took the Lord Jesus onto the precipice of a hill and they would throw him off. But he walked through the midst of them. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. The Lord was the refuge of his own son, Jesus Christ. But now let's take these words as applied to us. You see, safety and peace is promised to us in an unsafe and a vile and a wicked world, a world where we face opposition. Verse three, in the deadliest of times, we can know God's presence. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. In the worst of times, God will be with his people. I believe that we cannot take these words in this way. Well, if I walk with God, I can walk into a hospital where there's coronavirus and I can be sure that I will not contract it. That would be abuse of scripture. But what we can say is this, no matter, no matter where we are and what we're doing, if we're honouring God and if we're his children, the Lord will be with us, whether we contract an illness or not. And so often he will protect us and so often he does deliver his children. In the trial, in maybe the time of sickness, the Lord is with us to deliver us. In the worst of times, look at his tender care. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. Isn't that wonderful? The picture of a hen there and all these vulnerable little chicks running to come underneath the wings, a place of warmth and security and protection. And that's how God, he's a tender God, he's a kind God. We can run to him with all of our fears, with all of our troubles, and we can come under his wing. But you know, verse one tells us, this is for one who dwells in the secret place of the Most High and abides under the shadow of the Almighty. The Lord is saying, you must come near, you must draw near to me and I will draw near to you. You must not just stay with me for a while, but you must make your home with me. You must abide with me and I will abide with you. Come close to me and then feel my tender, loving care. And look at it, it's a strong care. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. The word of God will be within you, giving assurance to you. The word of God will be shaping your thinking, that you'll be able to think in biblical ways. It'll be like truth bound around you, that so that when the darts of the enemy come in, and when the doubts come in, and when the attacks come upon you, the word of God will enable you to stand firm. It's a strong care. God has given his truth as a shield for you to protect you in difficult times. So we've seen a certain care that God has given to us in days of great difficulty. Surely, surely he shall deliver you. We've seen his tender care. Under the shadow of his wings you must come for refuge. We've seen strong care, the strength of the word of God. Now let's consider this continual care by day and by night, at the noonday and at midnight. Look at this, verse five. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Perhaps at times you've laid awake and you've been troubled and worried at night. Perhaps those night 
thoughts have become monsters, nightmares. They've troubled you and they've overwhelmed you. Well, the Lord says, cast all that upon me. Come into my presence under the shadow of my wings. And know that in that place, when you're in the place of the tabernacle of God, in, the, in his very presence, that you can know sweet sleep, that he can take away the worry and the fears. Remember David, Psalm 3, Psalm 4. There he is, the thousands who've risen up against him. But the Lord is his glory. The Lord is his, is his grace. The Lord lifts up his head. The Lord makes him to lie down and sleep in safety. The Lord gives him sweet peace. You see, his circumstances might be terrible, but the Lord has drawn near as he has drawn near to the Lord. So whether it's the terrors by night or it's the destruction that lays waste at noonday, the Lord has said that it shall not come near you. Verse seven and eight, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. God is for his people. You see, in this world, God judges, he acts. Read in the New Testament of King Herod, so proud. And the Lord struck him down when he was receiving glory to himself. And he, ate, and he was eaten by worms, that awful disease in his stomach. The Lord is able to humble the rulers of this world, to show them that they are nothing. The Lord does intervene in this world. He does act. There are temporal judgments in this world. But for the Christian, the Lord has said that he will keep him safe. He will not let him be judged on that final day with the rest of mankind. He may see the evil ones being judged by God, but God will protect him. God will have him. He is the Lord's. He does not need to fear. Yes, at times a temple judgment may come upon a church. In Corinth, we read that some were sick. Some had already slept. But why? That they wouldn't be judged with the world. It was a remedial judgment, a purifying of the church, but also a taking of those people to himself, that they wouldn't continue in their ways and pollute, but be brought to glory and saved if by fire. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. The Lord's people are safe. And then verses 9 to 10, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Now, as I've said, we can't use that as an automatic promise for um, absolute protection from disease or from this coronavirus. You know, just sometimes God gives a gift of faith to his people individuals and they give them that certainty and assurance in their, in their hearts that the Lord will look after them and bring them through. That was the case with Spurgeon. He saw these words in the window of a shop. It was the time of the cholera outbreak and he was given a certainty in his heart that he would not die, that he would not contract this disease. And so he continued to visit the people, the poor and the dying. And he held on to the promise. It was a gift of faith that had been given to him specially. And the Lord kept him. We are the Lord's people. And he loves us. He doesn't change. No matter what our circumstances are, he's always for his people. Always loving his people. Satan may attack us. There may be fears within. Your mind may be greatly troubled, but the Lord is with you. And then he ends this psalm with a wonderful, triumphant 
declaration. Now verses 14 to 16 again is a switch. Verses 1 to 2 was in the first person. Verses 3 to 13 was addressing you. But now verses 14 to 16 ends with triumph. It's God now speaking. Because he has set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. How good not only to hear the testament of God's servant speaking to us, but how much better to hear God speaking in first person. I will deliver him because he trusts in me. Friends, read and meditate upon this psalm and may your soul be encouraged. But just two other thoughts this evening to encourage your hearts. Because maybe some of you are concerned about the church. We're not meeting together. Some of you are maybe burdened about that. And some of you are maybe even worried about the breakup of the church. Well, I trust that we are gathering together as one. Sundays listening to the same messages together, praying together, seeking God, keeping together as the Lord's people. The Lord has given me that great responsibility to feed you as your pastor. I trust that the Lord will continue to bless us even though we're apart. But maybe you're fearful and God has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the Apostle Paul could say this in 2 Timothy 2.9, I suffer trouble. As an evildoer, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. That's the wonderful truth. You cannot stop God. You cannot stop the progress of the gospel. You cannot stop his purposes. The word of God will never be chained. And so who knows what may happen? Adrian Carey Jones reminds us that in 1857 there was a world economic collapse like it had never been seen before. And then in the following two years, 1858 and 1859, God sent a mighty spiritual revival to the nations of his world. Staggering. The nations are in financial ruin. People in Britain cannot even get the money out of their banks. That's 1857. Then the following two years, God sweeps through with revival power, saving thousands and thousands and thousands of people. You know, days of darkness sometimes are preludes to much better days. We ought to hope in him. The word of God is not chained. Think of how God is speaking to many people across the Internet. Think of that little video, eight minute video of the Belfast pastor that's been shared around Facebook. It's a powerful testament of how the Lord delivered him when he was sick in hospital, suffering from coronavirus in Belfast. Think of the testimony of that pastor in Italy, dying of coronavirus. What an impact he had upon those around him. Think of unusual things that are happening. ITV News, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, reporting that nurses in London were praying before they went in to the coronavirus unit. Imagine four weeks ago, would that ever have been reported, something like that? If it got to the news, there'd be a smirk on people's faces or there'd be downright scorn. But now they're taking it seriously. Who knows what the Lord is going to do through this time? The word of God is not changed. So be encouraged. Your God is your refuge. You can run to him. You can know safety and peace in your heart. And the word of God will triumph. And then lastly, we've thought that God hasn't changed. You can depend upon him as your rock. We've thought that the gospel is not chained. It's not chained, no. But lastly, You may just change through this period. And lastly, I want us to bring you to Hebrews chapter 12 and quote a couple of verses from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down 
and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Therefore strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. Brothers and sisters, maybe this is a time of healing for the church. Maybe this is a time where discouraged Christians, and that's generally been the trait of UK Christians in recent years. Churches where there's little joy, churches where people hang their heads, churches where people to struggle to come to the prayer meetings, churches where, where there's a lot of murmuring and complaining. Maybe just maybe that now this is the time that your hands will be strengthened. That you will begin to look to the Lord in prayer, lifting up the whole holy hands in prayer. That you'll find strength in your feet, putting you back on your feet to be a strong Christian soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you won't be drooping in your faith. That you won't be feeble any longer in your faith. But you'll be reinvigorated and restored and healed. Maybe you've known the chastening times of the Lord in your life. And those times are difficult. But remember, it's a loving Heavenly Father who disciplines his children. He disciplines in love. And maybe it's time now that those trooping hands will be lifted up and you would again be able to go forward as a strong Christian. Some of you in recent years maybe have been going backwards rather than going forwards. May this be the time, the time when you're alone in your home, where you begin to seek the face of God and know those refreshing times that come from his presence. So look back to Psalm 91. Think of the wonderful promises that God gives to his people. Hold on to them. Believe in them. Come under the shadow of his wing. Abide under that shadow of his wing. Stay there. No more of him. May God bless each one of you. Amen.